to the show with your friend and mine. So tell me, Dr. Squee, who's it gonna be this time? We like to hear you talk, and we love to hear you listen. And if you are not subscribed, you won't know what you're missing. So welcome to the Dr. Squee Show. Welcome to the Dr. Squee Show. Welcome to the Dr. Squee Show. Tonight, Squee welcomes... Terry Ivans! And now here's the man himself, Dr. Squee! Hello and welcome to the Dr. Squee Show. Today, on a double interview day, we're going to be talking all things 86 Melrose Avenue, along with so much more with my two guests today. The first of which is up right now. So uh, she's an actor who's been in basically everything from uh, Highway to Heaven to Doogie Howser, ABC's After School Special, The Monsters Today, Coach Baywatch, Melrose Place, Boy Meets World, Married with Children, Breast Men, the film with David Schwimmer, All My Children, Par- Piranaconda, uh, and her own chat show, Going to Bed with Terry Ivans. You'll never guess who it is. And she is also, uh, like, apparently, She's just out of bed because it's five o'clock here, but it's merely nine in the morning for them. So welcome to the Dr. Squee Show, bright and early in the morning for her. Terry Ivans. How are you doing today, <laughs> Terry? Oh, you know what? It's looking pretty good right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, just like I, I feel like I have to start every interview at the moment with how are you? How's this year been? Like, how have you been coping, especially in the entertainment industry? How's it all going for you? Well, I've I've been in this business for over 30 years and I've seen the business morph over major times, whether it be institutional or uh, catastrophic like 9-11. I was on a soap opera on ABC called All My Children and I was lucky enough to be employed on that show when 9-11 hit. The, in, the entertainment industry, let alone other industries, just collapsed, right? They went silent. And it was a very similar feeling that I had last year in the first, you know, last weeks, I guess, the last weeks of March, where we went down basically all of us in the entire world into a shutdown. And I had that same feeling as 9 11. And I'm seeing the aftermath as we go, walk through the same thing with every institution. Things are changing, and I and it'll be interesting to see what never goes back to what used to be. And sometimes a lot of that's going to be great, right? Because we always need to improve and grow as people. Uh, it's like interviews, for you know. Now every audition interview is like this. It's Zoom, and so I'm responsible for everything, right? When Pre last year, I would go into an office like anyone else would, and you would do a face to face interview. Well, the pros for me going face to face is you, I'm face to face. There's a personal connection, a, a smile that you can readily, hopefully, feel, right? But on the Zoom, I'm now I'm two dimensional, right? It's a uh, there's no uh, you can't feel the warmth that I bring into a room, right? I'm not walking in and lighting it up, right? But we have to adapt, and I think. I was talking to my manager last night. I don't know if interviews will ever go back to the way they were. I think they're going to keep it at Zoom because economically for casting directors and production houses, it's so much cheaper. They don't have to rent space. Uh, You think of pollution. They're not tons, hundreds of actors driving back and forth and all over Hollywood, right? We're all at home. So it'll be interesting to see. I, I'm hoping that the caliber and quality of films rises because it, all of the um, SAG men, mandates that are put in place are really kind of hurting the um, lower budget and ultra low budget films because they can't afford all of the protocols that are needed for COVID. So it's right. going to be interesting to see how the business changes. But as always, you know, the entertainment business will survive and it will thrive again. You know, Mardi Gras, or not Mardi Gras, vaudeville once upon a time was the height, right, of all entertainment. And that, you know, went away, thankfully. So, you know, <laughs> other parts of the world will too. 
I, I think there's something in what you were saying there, though, that it's like, you know, 9-11 is pr probably kind of the best parallel in recent times we've got. But even with that, that was as horrific as it was, and I'm no way undermining that whatsoever. But like, right. you know, that was one area of America, and right. America was in shock for it for a long time. And obviously it changed flight then going forward. But, right. but at the end of the day, like, you know, the, the people were able to, in most parts, lead a normal life after that like go back to life because but this is everywhere this is all over the world and this is so kind of like fundamental as you say it kind of changes what you're allowed to do on a film set and how much it costs which is kind of very kind of dangerous for these independent projects right and not just entertainment but all businesses i mean just think of like what you said about the airlines right post or pre 9 11 they used to give us pillows and blankets right we we could walk around back and forth um you right and after 9 11 i had a child i couldn't bring in baby formula or apple juice or chicken fingers like they wouldn't let me bring anything and i'm like oh my god i'm flying from new york city to california with an infant and you're not letting me bring anything but that was the new rule and now very little all these what it's almost 20 years or it is 20 years later just about they still won't let you bring in you know liquids right so it'll be interesting yeah. i i wonder you know like with the vaccine I, i'm all for independent businesses having control over their business so if they say no right for refusal of service i'm like hey that's it's your thing so it'll be interesting to see like what transportation does uh with the vaccine thing and you know everybody wants to make things political i for me it's it's just uh i want to make people comfortable so if it's if it makes the yep. people around me more comfortable that i have a mask on then i have no problem wearing one if it makes them more comfortable for me to have a mask off I, i'm happy to have it off but then you know as a germaphobe i'm like okay i appreciate the distance too <laughs> <laughs> yeah i want to make feel, people feel comfortable too but you might have to persuade me for the mask to be off that, that everything's really safe myself i know right <laughs> Because once you catch it, man, everybody's, it's kind of like, um, what's that other awful, ugly disease, uh, meningitis, where it just affects everyone's system different. So, yeah. you know, this thing, I actually, I wasn't going to tell anyone, but I'll tell you, I got my Johnson & Johnson shot yesterday. Hey, one, look, the one shot. The one shot, one and done. I was so excited about oh. that. So I'm not really a needle person. I my. My boyfriend says you can take the really out of that statement, Terry. But uh, yeah, but look, next morning I'm feeling good. My arm doesn't even hurt. You know, I did I did the exercises to keep it moving through the blood. But um, you know, I went through that period of time where they're like, look for symptoms, and here I am. I'm feeling good, and I feel that much more safe that when I see my mom tomorrow, maybe. I get to give her a hug since I haven't touched her in over a year. Yeah, that's that's the strangest, like just not being able to see family or like hug them yeah. if you do. And yeah, I mean, I, I've got my first shot so far and I, I thought it might make me feel a little bit better, but if anything else, I'm like, no, I've got this far. I'm gonna wait until I've got the second shot like because I'm, I'm on the two shot system. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But again, but it's what people feel comfortable with because I think if individual, if we are comfortable with ourselves, then we can project a more positive, uh, you know, projection, and therefore it should it should be catching. The positive should catch. We have so much negative, and it seems the negative sticks to people, whether you realize it or not. And we have to chase the positive, literally, like chase joy, find it for your daily life. You know, whatever there is that is lovely to talk about, if there's anything of a good report, because there's always many reports, right? But we want to yeah. find a good report and meditate on that for our own sanity. Hey, hey, we're all for kindness is the kind of like uh, the motto of this this show, certainly. So uh, oh, let, let's... That. Let's get on to you, though. Come on. So, uh, like, you've been in the business for 30 years, which, by the way, doesn't look possible. I just have to put it out there. But, uh, yeah, how did it all kind of start for you getting into acting? Oh, my gosh. Uh, I, well, I was a teenager, and my dad was in the entertainment business. He was a rock drummer. He played with uh, Freddie Fender, who was, you know, people most likely know him as the Fender guitar, but he's this huge wow. rock and roller dude, right? And that was yeah, his yeah. 
So I grew up um, backstage. Uh, I met Kiss, the band Kiss, without their makeup on when I was a child. I think I was like 11 or 12. So as a second generation entertainment kid, I did have that help, but not big enough coattails. Like, you know, if I was a Terry Hanks, you know, I mean, that would have been a lot better. <laughs> but uh, yeah, then I did a, a, a beauty pageant for seniors in high school called America's Junior Miss. And I received, I didn't win the whole thing, but I won enough scholarship money that I paid for college and I moved to California on my own instead of traveling back and forth with my parents uh and that's kind of how it started uh within two years i was up and going on my own fox had just started becoming their own network so i did one of the first tv series for fox called boys will be boys with matthew perry from friends right. yeah. and we were boyfriend and girlfriend and we were so young we we're babies and I became a Fox girl and worked a lot of the Fox shows early on in, you know, in the beginning of their conception as a network. Because I know Matthew Perry did like every pilot under the sun before he actually landed on Friends. <laughs> yeah, we ran into each other in a supermarket, you know, ages ago before Friends. And he was so depressed. <laughs> we had already had our show and our show went and probably would have continued to go but the writer strike hit during those years i think it was 1990 or something and so all the shows went flat uh but we were already like in our eighth episode when our our plug got pulled but i remember seeing him and him going you know at one point terry you just have to look at the common denominator and the common denominator is me <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully he was wrong he's a success <laughs> yeah, no, that's good to see. And uh, for you, like where you, your, your dad was in the entertainment business and in rock and roll itself, does that make him more strict or less? Because he's seen a lot of stuff is the other thing. Oh, yeah. Like I was <laughs> never allowed to date a musician. Like never. <laughs> and I, you know, and I have, but my dad has never approved. He's like, yeah, no. That and like a first baseman. He's like, no, those are the worst type of men. <laughs> First baseman, meaning not on the bass guitar, but on baseball, right? Oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> you see, over my English head right there. I was like, yeah, yeah. it's like, yeah, guitar. Yeah, that's where, where right. I Right. I had to clarify. Yeah. But my dad was very, um, he's creative. So he, you know, I felt nothing but support when I wanted to pursue acting. Um, and And I just did my first singing gig ever on television for the reboot Funky of Brewster. yeah funky Brewster. i was so excited and we filmed it during the lockdown and so i had to go through the whole thing of nbc and universal where we were stuck in our own little color pods i got covid testing twice maybe three times a day uh i live in quarantine and you're like this is for a sitcom kid show really <laughs> but hey we are all safe they did an entire season, which is remarkable. Uh, most productions, or not, I should say most, but any production that had three people that came down with COVID, the entire production company got shut down. Yeah, because there was that uh, video. Oh, I'm trying to remember. It was um, Tom Cruise. Yes. Like of him freaking out on the set, which <laughs> everyone kind of like, there was a lot of kind of negative press for him, but I kind of understood where he was coming from. Like, if if you get too many co co bad COVID tests, then everyone loses their job. I, I kind Ooh. of felt for him. Absolutely. And I think he was at his last straw when we, because of course, you know, the media only wants to give us the worst of everything, right? It may be, you know, a riot on one corner, but it makes it look like it's a riot throughout the entire city, right? And vice versa, no matter. So uh, living it and being actually driving on a major studio lot here in, in Los Angeles, it, I mean, they took it so serious. I mean, it was like a little ant farm of watching all the different testing and actors and, and like you weren't allowed to walk around the lot to see your other friends that may be on another stage. Like, and, and, oh, 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 this is, so there's this show here. I don't know if you guys get it um, called, um, it's not American Idol, it's The Voice. So The Voice yeah, film yeah. 
on NBC and they had this this uh, singer who was this operatic guy who was amazing. And then I, I didn't watch all that much that season. And all of a sudden I, I realized he was gone. So I just figured he must've gotten voted off. But I'm like, I don't know how, cause he, I mean, he was amazing. And then I learned while he was there that he didn't follow the COVID protocol while he was on the stage or there on the lot and he got released. He got fired from the, sh just like that. And they told me I had to go through a two hour course of the do's and don'ts of just the lot. And they said their people are walking around for your protection, but they weren't there for my protection. They were there to blow the whistle. So if you got reported once, it was a warning. Twice, you were fired. Wow. Did you get any warnings? No, you kind of kidding? I walked around with a mask and a shield. <laughs> I have my personalized ionic thing that makes all the, the particles that fly out of people's mouth just drop to the ground. Because <laughs> I did notice, like, I might. I'm actually curious about this because watching TV shows now, I know that they've kind of got just uh, really rigorous testing so they can have people in close proximity. But it right. seems like the staging is slightly different. Like if people can be apart, they seem to be more. Am I just imagining that or have they been doing that more? No, I mean, you have to think about it. Like I do another show that's multi Emmy winning called The Bay that's on Amazon and I play a prostitute. Well, you know, Physical distancing is not part of her craft. <laughs> I don't think I'm so good at this character because I socially distance. So it's interesting because I had to trust that the actors that I was working opposite were quarantining or, you know, li living quarantined, quote, lifestyle while we were filming because even though we weren't kissing or we, you know, we had clothes on, we still, I mean, even proximity, I would, I, I felt weird not, I, I actually, actually asked, like, is it all right if I touch you? And I don't know if anybody else feels this way, but I'll occasionally meet someone, uh, especially after we've been tested and whatnot, they're like, Terry, and they want to run up and initially just give you a hug. And I feel like I'm, you know, the kitty cat from Pepe Le Pew. And I'm like, oh, you know, like, oh, Hi, it's great to see you. But I'm frozen because I don't know what I'm supposed to do. It's like etiquette on how we're supposed to be cordial and polite. And yeah. you know, I don't know where that line is anymore. And I think as a society of the global world, we need to come up with what that is. Because I don't want to offend. And I don't, I don't know anything more offensive than someone reaching out and touching you. And you're going, oh, hi. <laughs> you know, yeah. and that's me right now. So I don't... <laughs> Yeah, when they, because um, we've been in and out of lockdown, it's kind of all been a bit crazy here in the UK and England. We, like, we've like we even yeah. got in different parts of the UK, England, uh, Wales and Scotland got different rules. But uh, at one stage, we were kind of out of it for a little while, uh, but we meant to still socially distance went out. Yeah. And uh, this friend of mine, like, we met up with a few friends from college and uh, one of them went to hug me and I go, she goes, oh, no, I don't mind. I'm a hugger still. I go, yeah, yeah. And I'm healthy and I want us all to stay that way. Yeah, so let's just keep like this. Let's be really friendly from afar. I I always, when I see someone coming up all excited, I'm like, oh, jump hug, jump hug, jump hug, <laughs> to keep the distance. And then they laugh and like, oh, okay, yeah, jump hug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's ridiculous, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. Definitely, definitely. And I'd rather cause a little bit of offense than get a lot of COVID, to be honest with you. Oh, <laughs> I think the worst is, if I ever found out that someone that I had just seen or whatnot got sick, right? And then I'm thinking, oh my God, I, not that I just saw them, maybe I'm sick, but oh my God, am I one of those people that didn't even know I had it and I just gave it to someone? Like yeah. that thing is just horrifying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my mom's in her 80s, like, so I've just, um, I'd rather not see her for, for a year, which has been really difficult, but right. then, then risk giving anything to her. Yeah, the whole, uh, you know, through the window. I, I had Mother's Day through the window with my mom. And yeah, the whole whole nine yards, which I kind of think she's appreciating in a deeper level because <laughs> I got my germophobia from someone. <laughs> Hereditary. <laughs> Let's talk about some of your projects, though. So like uh, some of the ones which jumped out to me, just like the ones which made us over here probably more than anything. But Highway to Heaven, that was oh, that, that was on 
every Sunday throughout my childhood. Yeah. I talked a bit about going on that one. Oh my God. Working with Michael Landon was one of my first bucket lists, right? Because we grew up with him, right? Little House on the Prairie. And so when Highway to Heaven came out and it was one of my early jobs because I was a high schooler, um, I can say, I can contest and I can see the episode it was uh, with Mr. Zelinka, who is like 82, 83 years old. And his name is Lou Ayers. And he played like our teacher that we were celebrating. He, that actor, who's no longer with us, rest his beautiful soul, gave me the wonderful gold nugget, which I'll share with you. But he, he was 80 some years old. And he was in the first movie that ever won the Academy Award for Best Picture. Right. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, Lou, what was that like? I mean, that must have been amazing. And he's like, to be honest, we had no idea what it was. And the picture was about World War One. And then I went and fought in World War Two. I'm like, <laughs> OK, it kind of puts everything in order. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so I mean, they told us this was an Oscar. Yeah, cool. OK, whatever. <laughs> right, right. And so then his gold nugget, because I'd everyone I worked with that was of that stature of amazement to me, I would ask, give me a gold nugget for me to take on with my career. And Lou Ayers was so kind. And he said, get the lowest billing you can possibly get. Even if you're starring in the movie, get your billing below the title. And I'm like, what? And he's like, because anything above the title takes responsibility for the film and most films are going to be a flop and he got right and he goes and if you're in the movie at all get the lowest billing possible and you will work forever and i'm like okay and guess what i guess he's right because i've never really fought for billing my agents and what do but i personally don't i kind of take what comes and uh 30 plus years lou Harris was right yeah, because uh, like I, I, we've all seen these films where actors like fight to get their name put down right. and taken off when it's flopping. Right. And then what do you do? You remember that. And it's not just the audience that remembers. It's the studio heads because they don't even watch the movie. They just see the numbers. Right. Yeah. So that's what Lou Ayers is really talking about. It's like getting over your own self-promotion back then when promotion was just where your name falls in a billing not about how many likes you have so but again it's just about the numbers and that's really all the studio heads i believe look at because they've got so much going on they really unless you know their assistants do deep seated research which their research according to everyone is always about the numbers yeah, because I mean, there is, of course, there is something to playing a character for a long period of time, kind of getting in that skin of the character for a long time, as you've done, uh, like in All My Children. But I I find kind of uh, character actors, uh, I don't know if you call yourself that, but like it, it seems to be your kind of career. Uh, I just get to do the most, kind of all the stuff. You get to do all the different parts. You get to play with all the toys. You know, I had a, I have a wonderful acting coach that I've had basically my entire life, Andrew McGarrion, and he teaches by the moment, being in the moment, right? We're in a moment right now. I'm going to be aware of what you say and really listen. And it's those things that give you the heads up as an artist in acting. It's so, it shouldn't be called acting. It should be called reacting, right? It's really about listening because how do you know or I know what the next person is going to say, right, in this moment? But if we're engaged and we have eye contact and we're listening, then it's more interesting. And in that, then the doors open for all different kinds of characters, which is the fun of acting. If you're just playing yourself and you're just thinking about how I would act in this situation or how I would behave in a situation, that's fine. But the whole point is, is bringing, having fun as the person is bringing together all these other avenues, having a perspective other than your own and approaching it from that point of view. How would this person who lost their mother and father at childbirth, you know, how would they look at, you know, and so to do character acting for me is the biggest compliment, especially because I, I can get pigeonholed in just like my face or uh, maybe, you know, what I look like, whether it's skin, the hair, right? And if I'm a character actor, then I'm allowed to, you know, be, they call it in Hollywood, dumb down, which I'm sure they're going to quit using that because it's a term to uh, not be as camera 
friendly, not being, you know, as because they can put makeup on a certain way and make you go, wow, she's gorgeous, beautiful, or he's gorgeous, beautiful. And then they can dumb you down. And that's meant to say that you're not so attractive. I'm sure that's not PC and that they're probably removing that right now. <laughs> yeah, because it's like I, I love it when they do that on films as well. They put someone in who's blatantly a gorgeous human being and yes. they dumb them down. Mm -hmm. And it's like you're blatantly still a gorgeous human being. Like right. don't try and don't try and monkey with us like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> so that's it's the nerdy character who removes removes the glasses and waves their hair around and then <laughs> suddenly they're gorgeous. I know they were gorgeous already. <laughs> Well, that's what Clint Eastwood said about Angelina Jolie when she, he directed her in that wonderful movie that was a period piece where she played the mother where her son was uh, kidnapped. And he said, the greatest tragedy with her talent is that she's so gorgeous, you can't hide it. And, you know, yeah, that's a wonderful compliment. But as a character actor, it makes it really tough because she's so, her, 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 things are just so prominent that uh, it's hard. She'd have to use prosthetics like, you know, Nicole Kidman, you know? Yeah, because like, I mean, I appreciate. Right, and then even then, look at the women and then the men. It's not even a gender thing. It's like a, like an itis. Everyone has got like Botox itis. They're, they're afraid to age because they're, they're like, uh, there's no parts written for people over a certain age. Everyone wants to stay as young as possible. You said it yourself. You can't believe I've been in, in the business for over 30 years. You know, there's pressure. So yeah. what are you going to do? And how do you age gracefully? And how do I teach my daughter to grow old gracefully and with joy? Right. Yeah, because there, there is this whole thing of like they'd rather hire someone who is young and attractive and make them look old mm -hmm. and make them look like they've got gray hair and do all this stuff to make them look like Which someone looks, they could, should just mm -hmm. hire. They could yeah. hire someone who is older or who looks like that, but they'd rather hire some gorgeous they can make out to look different. And it just seems crazy to me. Yeah. You know, that's why I really enjoyed 86 Melrose Place is because Lily gave me one of my first opportunities to really not be attractive. I mean, for, for me, I look, my hair is all slicked back, you know, yeah. to my head, right? I'm in that, you know, detective lighting in a dusk, dark, gloomy room i'm wearing drab colors right my makeup oh, yeah. is really nil like i have nothing on so it was it's tough for me especially in the beginning to watch because the first time i watched it and i'm gonna apologize right now mom because of how i opened up this statement i looked at it i'm like oh my god that's my mother like <laughs> every i'm reading something in scowling i'm like oh my god that's my mom <laughs> I think it's just great. The the thing I loved about uh, the scenes which you're in, it's all uh, it's it's very much the, that scene from a lot of films. And it's like I'm not saying that it's kind of derivative, but it's like there must be a jury to play something which is a staple of so many films of having the interrogation scene. Right. I love the way because we shot it completely different, and the way Lily edited it was, I thought phenomenal and so creative and and fed the storyline and the unknowns in the in the script the original script before edit um i was in the whole movie from start to finish but if you already know there's a detective in the beginning of the movie you kind of know there's something criminal that probably happened so they didn't want to give away what really the crux, you know, the hook, the balance of the movie. So I thought it was genius the way they did it and uh, much more viewer engaging. So I applaud yeah. it. Even though I got taken out of the first half and then they did that great sequence, which I think was genius. So as, as a producer mind, uh, I would have probably done the same thing if my editor had suggested it. Yeah, and uh, to talk about the movie, so like, uh, what's it like working with a female director as well? Because that's something which we're finally starting to see a bit more of, but still very short on the ground. Right, and you know, I'm not one, you know, I'm all for diversity and equal opportunity for sure, equal pay, absolutely. 
But I'm not about like, oh, we should give someone a job just because of the way they look or how they identify. I really, I think it should be on your qualifications because if a movie sucks, it sucks, right? You need people that know what they're doing. And that goes across the board in every form of business. You know, just because you look the part doesn't mean you can do a good job. And, you know, that's where I think, you know, life is imitating art, right? In acting, we want people that look the part, right? Because we're just pretending. But in real life, <laughs> we need them really to know what they're doing. And the women I've worked with, I've worked with a few women directors. They know what they're doing and they have fought hard to get that opportunity. It wasn't just handed to them because of the way they looked or how they identified. And that's of all races, you know, uh, uh, Punky Brewster, I worked with my first black female director. Lily uh, is, you know, she's... Uh, uh, Lebanese? Yes, but I was gonna say, um, uh, what do we call, I, I don't even know the words to say anymore that are correct. A minority, right? She's a minority female, right? Yep. Uh, director. I've worked, I did a movie uh, that was called, oh God, I can't remember what it's called. Um, it'll come to me. And I had a female lesbian director. Yeah. So, uh, but of all the work, I can name three. That's pretty sad. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the flip side of what you're saying is, and so it's totally right. People shouldn't just just get a movie because of uh, what box they fall into. However, I think it's about people who haven't been given those opportunities, haven't been enfranchised to go towards kind of getting these certain qualifications, like who haven't got a roadmap to being director because they haven't seen it to be it. Well, right. I think that's what we where we need to do on work. everything. You have to work the chain of command, right? No matter what business we are, right? You start in the mail room, right? right? That's the ongoing thing. You start in the mail room and then you work your way up. And that's kind of in America, that's been our capitalism. You get up earlier than everyone else, you do the extra time, you will be promoted. And it really does happen like that here. So I think the problem in it is that a lot of the opportunities on the lower levels get bypassed. Uh, I worked on, uh, like as you said, Melrose Place, and uh, I screen tested for a lot of Aaron Spellings. He's not with us anymore, rest his soul. Uh, a lot of his uh, productions. And I will tell you that there was one season where the, he had so many productions going in for pilot season that he didn't know what the right hand and the left hand were doing. So, under his umbrella, he had both TV series, but the producers on this one were competing with the producers on this one. My manager should have probably just come out and said, okay, look guys, you guys are competing against yourself. But she was like, hey, if they don't know, they don't know. And they kept raising my rate, competing against themselves. Well, the, the two contracts hit Aaron Spelling's desk. Well, he's not dumb right he's not <laughs> aware of what he's paying for and he's like what the heck right you guys are just making me pay more <laughs> and did you say but i've signed it now so it's too late to worry about it <laughs> no you cut me out of the entire process and said what does she need that kind of money for she's a girl oh geez oh uh, look you know as you say go rest the soul and everything but that yeah, that's not good. You know, you know, that's back in the late or early 90s, mid 90s. So, you know, it was yeah. different then. And look, and now we're not starting, but we're still really in those beginning stages of that type of attitude being filtered out. You know, I think it really does take an entire generation to move out of those big uh blocks of uh social uh identities or understandings like you know once upon a time all in the family was the rage of sitcom television right uh i don't know if you even know of it uh where they had meat right uh and like i remember watching reruns with my dad and everyone thought it was so funny archie bunker you know he could say the rude crass things and it was a hit because there even though everyone knew it was wrong we wanted to laugh at it and it kind of was educational of what's not acceptable, yeah. right? But then fast forward and Roseanne gets rebooted and Roseanne kind of is 
the Archie Bunker, right? She's saying all those crass, unbelievably ridiculous things that were like, what? Oh my God. Yeah, but I don't think she realized how ridiculous they were. I think she was selling those as good. Well, whatever, That's Archie cool. Bunker could have believed it too. But we, <laughs> I think we missed an opportunity by judging it by if we see that, at least we can then have something to go, wait a minute, we're laughing at it. We're saying like with Archie Bunker, I don't think there was anyone at the end of that show that was like, I wanna be just like Archie Bunker, right? So, but yeah. instead the way they fixed it wasn't wasn't to right uh, have the character learn through the episodes, right? It was just cancel her, right? Just cancel that character. And I think that's where they made a mistake. But a lot of that, I think, lies in fear. Fear of, you know, uh, you know, the woke mob and cancel culture. And, you know, it was alive and well then. People may only know those words today because we've been forced to live on our screens. But they've been around for a long time. You know, back, uh, you know, in the 40s and 50s, wasn't it called a blacklist? Right. Yeah, but but like I mean, with the case of Roseanne, for instance, she was selling it in her real life, and she was producing that to sell those ideas in a certain way. Is the problem True. like yeah. cause, cause we not, had Al, we yeah. had Alf Garnet over here, which is our Archie Bunker, like the the British version of that show. I'm oh. not sure which came first. And but like the 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 actor behind that uh, would talk uh, Warren Mitchell, I think it was. He would talk about how. Um, like people would stop on the street saying it's like, oh yeah, good, you stick out to them speaking about minorities. And he goes, No, no, we're laughing at you, mate. We're laughing at you. And that was the whole point was it was the joke was on the people who were selling these kind of misogynistic racist views. Whereas no. with Roseanne, it seemed to be selling the misogynistic views a little bit under her writing. It's just my Right. Well, I you know, to Arch I'm talking characters, not person not Yeah, people. yeah, yeah. No, yeah. But she was writing as well. So that was right. where that Archie Bunker's credit, I mean not credit, but I guess yeah. help aid, he didn't have social media, right? Because <laughs> he so he didn't have a megaphone to promote outside of his own doorway and newspaper. Whereas nowadays you know, you send out a tweet and eight years later, somebody can dig it up and then persecute. That's you for it. And I think That's that true. needs to be worked on. You know, we yeah. I don't know anyone that is faultless. And I think we need to be a little more forgiving and identify with each other and that we all can grow, must grow and will grow with love and strong words of you know condemnation at times but i think if if we're missing the like you know instruct but in love you know tell the truth speak the truth but in love don't speak the truth in anger because then we just i don't know about you but i'll just block it out if someone is yelling at me i don't even hear the words they say i just tune out because i'm like oh it's just loud and piercing but they could be saying something I completely disagree with. But if they come into here and like, Terry, have you ever thought about this? Then it makes me lean in because I got to hear. And then it's actually being absorbed. It's interesting little fact. It goes with public speaking. If you're on a microphone, don't yell. Speak softly. The room will go quiet because everybody just naturally leans in and you captivate the audience. I think there's certainly something very true in what you're saying that uh, like if someone has a tweet from 10 years ago and that's used to fire them. Yeah. It should be about what their views are now. Like if we really want to be this kind forgiving society, which I believe we do want to be, yeah. surely it should be about just because we've just heard this doesn't mean that's their view now. We heard this from like so many years ago and I think people should be given a chance to grow and evolve. I think some of the stuff Roseanne said was very vile and very kind of like, um, yeah, just, just not respectful for different races, whatever else. But if she then said, I feel like I've learned from this, I want to change yes. and came at it with some earnesty, then I think that she should be given the opportunity. Well, that brings us back to like our parents, right? Our parents grew up and had different ideas they, uh, you know, even like women, they were supposed to raise the children and not go to work, right? My whole uh, soap opera experience, all my children, soap mm -hmm. were created and called soaps because there was a brainchild in one of the networks that says, we have a, 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 
a graphic of people that we can sell to and we need to find a way to sell to them. So if we can get that average housewife while she's home to turn on the boob tube, which is another way, way, they, way they call it the boob tube, right? Because nursing moms at home, then we can sell them soap. Is that where that sense comes from? Yes. Really? <laughs> Soaps, because they were selling soap and cleansing boob tube because mothers were at home all day nursing their babies. So how can they market and sell advertising to them? And soap operas started to decline when I was on them um, after 9-11 because then we came out with everyone wants, you know, things immediately, right? It's all about... Uh, 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 convenience. So then we got our DVRs, right? And we started recording everything and fast forwarding over all the advertisements. Well, we shot ourselves in the foot. We fast forward over all the advertisements. We quit buying because we quit watching whatever we we're supposed to be force fed by Pepsi instead of Coke. So therefore, Pepsi's not a sponsor anymore because the advertising isn't working. <laughs> so then yeah, we got Netflix and on demand now. Right. <laughs> It's not all bad. I'm just saying, like we got on demand from that. But you know, there is a yin and yang. There is two sides of how we have to really be a balance. And and I think as viewers and as you know, patrons and consumers, we have to be aware of uh, how the media, how the entertainment business, how they feed us, how they project to us. Right. Even yourself, like I, you know, when I had my radio show going to bed with Terry Ivins, it was late night. Yeah. Which is why, oh, I'll use the double entendre going to bed with Terry. Well, now it's like it's not so PC. Like, I wonder if YouTube is going to go, you know what? We're going to, you know, remove those streams of her. <laughs> right. So I went and did Vimeo because Vimeo is not going to remove it just because the title might stand out as being something as porn. But when I was doing it, when we came up with the concept with many, many of us, we didn't think that at all. We were like, oh, yeah, but it's late night. Uh, you know, that that would be a way to catch viewers. I knew what yeah, I was yeah. doing, but eh, probably not so. Hey, hey, look, for me, if you want to use, let's face it, men's kind of own preconceptions against them, do it, I say. <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay to do it to men, but not to any other gender <laughs> yeah, i'm just saying well i'll come on look you know, I, i'm prepared to say being being the uh the sexuality i am the color of skin i am and the gender i am i people might of, of all those ilks have tend to have got the breaks over the years if kind of we get a bit of blowback now i can handle it i i love that you say that but like my dad is a white male through and through and you know, I remember watching Roots with him as a young kid and looking at him and going, oh, you're awful. You're <laughs> My dad's like, what? I wasn't there. That's not yeah, you. Yeah. Right? And that's from watching Roots as a child that I just got stuck in my head that, oh, my gosh, white men are mean. And that was wrong. That was a stereotype of that time period. Yeah. It's definitely not what it is today. So to see that white males, uh, now I'm not saying that all white males are innocent, and there is, and I, the word systemic really systematically from the bottom, moving up to the links, uh, always need to grow and change. But I think it's unfair to segregate any class of people, any gender of people, and any race. I think I think the difficulty is it's like we're all very much reacting very quickly to the Internet and the flow of information becoming so much quicker and it being harder for people who are doing some shady shit. Oh, the language. God, yeah. It was very it's very much hard, harder for them to keep it secret. So it all suddenly came out and we we're all reacting to this. And I don't think we any of us really know how to react. And so there is a, a whiplash effect of maybe. I don't know that I, I don't feel like again as a white straight cis male uh, whatever else I don't feel like I'm getting uh, maligned by this it's just like people are going it's like maybe people who fit that profile have got away with a lot of stuff they shouldn't be getting away with now and like there is a reaction to that are we reacting to it perfectly probably not but I think it's an okay reaction well you know. know there's always been uh from the beginning of time I mean 
you can read about it in the Old Testament where there were tribes of people, right? Your yep. family was a tribe and you did whatever was best for your tribe. If you were going to hire, you wanted to hire inside your family, right? Hire inside your tribe. So I think because of what things that have transpired throughout our countries, our multiple different countries, history, where you're right, the people with wealth had the power, and more times than not, the people that had the power were men, and it didn't matter what skin color they had, they were men, and so therefore, whatever tribes they were in, they had advances that went up like this, which is why, you know, women didn't even get, in, in America, women didn't even get considered for college scholarships for athletics until the late 70s because yep. title nine didn't even pass until like 72 or 74 and yep. now if they're wanting to take it completely off the books i'm like you just took women's rights completely off the table like what you're saying is right and true but you're going too far so you know yeah i mean but like i I feel like that um, see it to be it is what we're seeing at the moment. So we are starting to see like uh, Patty Jenkins uh, making Wonder Woman. And you've got uh, so many kind of wonderful black directors and uh, actors who are kind of taking the forefront. And it seems to be the more you represent these groups, the more you see them coming up. Because like, the, the, again, it's enfranchising right. people. What right. do you think is the most important thing to do within the industry to enfranchise uh, different people? Oh, I think it starts with the writing. I think we need to write stories about different people, races, ages. Uh, the entertainment business as a whole tends to target audience and produce for a target audience. So forever, they say 18 to whatever the age is, I think it's 40, 18 to 40, yeah, yeah. whatever that age is, that that's their target rate. So anyone that's over 40, they don't care about. And really then the, the child market's got their own thing, right? Like I worked on so many child shows, Doogie Howser, right? Punky Brewster, those are all prime time. They were at eight o'clock on a major network. Now all child programming are on cable. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? you get a whole child <laughs> channel instead. Right, they don't even give, you know, children networks or teen networks outside of your local, it's all cable, right? It's all the smaller stations uh, that give their time, their prime time lineup to that. So I think it starts with the writing. We need to write, but then, you know, there could be tons of writing, but if no one's going to watch it, no one's paying for the ticket to watch the stories about 70 year old grandparents, you know, learning how to swim, right? No matter how funny it might be, then there's no market for it. So it's, then you go, well, then it's not the writer, then it must be the consumer. So I think that is a round the circle yin yang of, you know, we as consumers have all the power. If we want something or do not want something, we buy it or we don't buy it. We watch it or we don't watch it. And then we can have control. And the power of the pen has always worked. Now that our children are very, very rarely ever using, learning how to use a utensil like a pen, but the power of our mind and, and writing it out, typing it out and sending an email but the power of the pen, actually taking the time to write it on paper, putting that stamp on it, that is still and has only become the most powerful force that we have as an individual. The only other thing I would argue about that is that also I think the uh, democratization of art being made possible by the independent, uh, by, by kind of by the Internet, people being able to put out their own stuff. Uh, has taken the power away from these kind of uh, these gatekeepers who decides what gets seen and what doesn't. Because as much as we can choose what we want to watch, if it's not put in front of us because people have stopped it being made, that's a huge problem. Now yeah. anyone can be a creator. Now anyone can put something on YouTube. You mentioned your your chat show went on YouTube. That's kind of taking power directly in your own hands, not waiting for someone else to do it, which I think is just so wonderful. Right. Right. And I have a lot of friends that have done that. Um, I have a great friend named David White who created this. Uh, it's like Netflix, but it's for very conservative, clean content. And it's called Pure Flix. And he uh, was I knew him as an actor from the time we were teenagers and way before everybody ever even thought of it. He's like, you know what? I'm going to make my own. 
And he not only did, but he created his own network and he's got his own channel and he did it way before anybody else. And now he's got all these great movies, but he's targeting to a certain demographic and he's honed in on it. So it maybe what you're saying is that there's now we have so many different streaming possibilities, right? D uh, that as a, uh, as a viewer, we can choose what service we're going to pay for and what content we want to watch. Yeah. Uh, think of like comes to mind on Netflix when they show that. And I'm not even going to say the name of that movie because I don't want to give it any pub. But basically it was like child pornography. And they were saying, no, it's showing this, this and this on one side, which, yeah, maybe it was. But kind of like my show, Going to Bed with Terry Ivins, it's also really leading down a road where it's hooking on. Uh, maybe, you know, not right thinking in a sexual sense regarding children. So Netflix really came under heat. I don't, I don't follow it. So I didn't know if they took it off or if they left it up there. But I know a lot of viewers canceled their uh, subscriptions to Netflix over those types of movies being shown on Netflix because they didn't want that type of uh, content on there, anything having to do with human trafficking or child pornography, which, you know, if they're going to go after on Twitter and on Facebook and on YouTube, a different uh, ideology or political view, then by all means, they should go after the human traffickers, right? I mean, we should at least as a global unit say no more human trafficking, let alone child pornography, can we at least protect our children? You know, the innocence. And I, it just really strikes me. It's hard for me to get on board when they are shutting down points of view and ideology when they're not shutting down illegal activity. I don't know. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think there's certainly enough problems to go around anyway. I think right? it's very difficult. To, you know, uh, hopefully it's not an either or scenario. Hopefully we can tackle all these things. I, I think it's due time. And if living through the entertainment business opens the eyes to these other diverse yeah. topics that are so important, then that's great because, right, right, what do they say? What comes first, the chicken or egg? Is life imitate art or art imitate life? Right. So, as entertainers, as your show, you have a vocal point, a megaphone to make change, to grow, and to educate your viewers on how they can remain in control and not let just one side just because they're angry do all the talking so how about for you terry given that you were a child actor yourself and we're talking about some of these kind of issues around uh, children protection like did you ever feel unsafe or threatened in any of the environments you were in as an actor i'm so happy to be able to answer this question no i uh, i was uh it has to be you know the grace of God, because yeah, it just because yeah, this town is really filthy. There, are, I used to say there are good hearts and bad hearts, and I was lucky enough to fall into the tribe of good hearts, and I mean tribe, just meaning just people that were good and real and had good intentions. Uh, I had uh, wonderful managers and agents that blocked all those things. I didn't, they didn't question me. I said, I didn't want to do nudity and I didn't want to do chop them up horror films. So I never auditioned for any of those type of roles. And then when I got old enough, uh, I had to start making that decision. And that's how I wind up on the soap opera because my agent said, look, you said you don't, <laughs> you, you don't want to do chop them up and yeah, you're, you're getting too old to play high school and you don't want to do nudity. So you're like, do you want to work? <laughs> 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 so they're like, we'll put you on a soap opera. You won't have to do nudity and you won't be chopping up body parts. How's that? And I'm like, ah, oh, okay. Then that's what I'll do. <laughs> I, I think you've got away with working just a little bit over the years. <laughs> yeah, I, but I've stuck to the things that are in my heart. And I think no yeah. matter what we do for a living, if we stick to our own set of fundamentals that make us look ourselves in the mirror and smile, then no matter what, we're going to feel good about ourselves. And we're going to project onto our children the same powerhouse. And if you get to your end of your career, and yeah, you've been on loads of 
big screen films, but you've been in uh, on TV shows and they're nothing that you want to do. What's the point? What, like, yeah, you've got the fame, but you haven't got what you actually went in it for. Right. Or how about how many of us, we're, we got what we asked for, and then when we're doing it, we're miserable. We're miserable because yeah. for whatever reason, it's not how we anticipated. I mean, I've had a lot of jobs where I really wanted, and then when I got them, I'm alone, <coughs> where I was like, I'm pulling my rolling suitcase down another lonely hotel hallway and my child is a toddler and I'm like, why am I doing this? I'm shutting the door. I'm eating alone. I'm alone. And this is before COVID, right? Actors live a very solid to life. And, you know, and I'm like, why is that? I'd rather be home with my baby than be, you know, on location living, which when I was younger, oh my God, I loved it. But, yeah. you know, as I got older, I'm like, gosh, there's so much more that I want. So, it, you know, now I don't, I, pers I personally make that choice of I still may feel lonely, but I'm counting the blessings. I'm thankful that I get this opportunity to, you know, earn a living. And I'm thankful that I get to meet new people. And I try to see all the positives, go see a museum in that city and learn about, you know, some people probably roll their eyes at that, but it's really true. I've, I've gone to some really amazing museums in different cities that I would never think of going, like in Oklahoma. I went to the Music Museum in Tulsa. There's nothing else to do, right? So, <laughs> and, and what did I see? I saw my my stepdad's name on the wall. I'm like, oh my god, this is so cool! Like, and he's like, oh yeah, I never told you that. I'm like, well, I, I knew you were from Oklahoma, but. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, just to wrap things up, like we've been talking about 86 Melrose Avenue out on the 20th of April. Please, everyone, do check it out. Uh, but what for you? Because you've worked on everything from kind of like these uh, big budget productions to kind of serialized TV shows, soap operas, and these independent films. What's the kind of appeal of these wonderful independent films for you? The appeal for me is storytelling uh, and the ability to be cast and hired. So much of the time, uh, they'll, they'll say A-list actors or whatnot, but uh, I think the studio heads fearful that they'll lose their job if their numbers aren't high enough uh, for box office draw, that they tend to rely on that name before and ahead of the title. And so a lot of great talent gets uh, missed opportunities. And then once that that name that's above the title flops a couple times. You notice they only give them about two times and then they're gone and then they have to produce things on their own. Uh, so for me, it's the quality of work. Like with Lily, her storytelling is so rich and so good. Um, uh, there's a purpose and a reason to watch it. And she's not telling you this is what you should think. She's opening your mind to question yourself, how do I really feel about that? Because I catch myself crying at moments that I wouldn't think would affect me, where I'm like, oh my gosh, or issues that I didn't even know were an issue. And I'm like, I want these people together. And then I'm like, well, why can't they be together? And like, Terry, don't you know, it's against the law in their countries for them to even talk to each other. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been living under a rock my whole life. And they're like, apparently so. I'm like, oh, so, it, you know, independent, filmmaking can bring to life so many things that we live in our own little bubble of getting our kids off to school on time and getting to work and you know, trying to exercise, right? Let alone get that color in our hair, get rid of the grays that we forget to ever be able to really pick up a newspaper and read the bottom of the lines instead of the headline. The headlines are always misleading, but if you go to like the last paragraph, you probably get exactly what they're talking about and that's better information. Well, obviously I can't relate to dyeing my hair. I'm a natural red, obviously, no grace here. <laughs> so we'll, <laughs> we'll wrap that up there. Thank you so much for joining oh. us today. Uh, just to remind everyone, that is uh, 86 Melrose Avenue, it's out on the 20th of April. Where can they find it? Oh my gosh, that's video on demand across every streaming network, uh, you name it, iTunes, Amazon, I mean, it's it's everywhere, thankfully, internationally and domestically. Fantastic. Check that out on the 20th of April. Thank you very much, Ter Terry Thank Ivins. That's been a fantastic chat today. Have a wonderful Easter, everyone. And join us later on tonight when I will be talking uh, at 8.30 uh, UK time. Please look up your own local time. I think it's 12.30 uh, PST. Uh, well, I'll be talking to the writer and director 
of 86 Melrose Avenue, and that's Lily Matter. Thank you very much for joining me today. I've been Dr. Squeed. That was my show. And remember, guys, in a world where you can be anything, please be kind. Uh -huh. I've been Dr. Squeed. That was my show. If you missed any part of this, you can enjoy it again Thursday, 8 p.m. on the bed.live radio. Thank you very much. Good.